Grace and peace. I am Dr. Marvin L. Sapp, and I would like to thank you for sowing into our ministry by purchasing one of the messages in which we wanted to share with the people of God across this nation. It is my hope and prayer that from what you've purchased on today and from what you've sold into, that you will be blessed from the message and that it will take you to a brand new dimension in God. This is my indeed prayer, but I want you to know a little bit more about our ministry, know about what we're trying to do in the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. You can always check us out at www.lighthouseflc.com. Find out a little more about me. Find out a little more about our church as well. Also, also, we have a brand new book out. It's called Stepping Out on the Promise. It's in the stores, or you can either call the ministry if you want more information about that, as well as a whole host of other different pieces of merchandise that you can bring into your library, and a brand new musical CD entitled Be Exalted, which is in the stores right now. But I want to just go forth and begin to share the word of God with you. Thank you once again, and I want to talk to you after the message. Say it again, hallelujah. Hallelujah. My goodness. You may be seated in the presence of our God tonight. Man, I thought I was going to have a little more time. And jump right in, I guess, huh? Well, it's good for us to be here again. Amen. I'm indeed grateful to God for this another wonderful Lord's Day, honor the Spirit of God. And I'm grateful to Him for giving us traveling mercies, bringing us safely over the airways to you all once more and again on this wonderfully beautiful day. It was a gorgeous day today. And I'm just so very grateful to God and honor your pastor, Victor Victor Curry, the bishop. And to all of the men and women of God who are on the podium along with me and to every last one of you, my father's children, we're grateful to God for being here. Um, I had a wonderful conversation. This, this week has been an extremely busy, well, last week was an extremely busy week for me. I was at a pastor's conference on Monday and Tuesday, and then I was in Atlanta Wednesday through Friday for MegaFest. And then on Saturday I came home and we had a big expo, and on Sunday uh, I was church all day long. But about, about 12 midnight, while I was lying in the bed talking to my wife, this little fella got up and ran in the room. And like he always does, he jumped in between me and his mother. And he looked at me and he said, Daddy, you've been gone all week. Where you going tomorrow? And I said to him, I'm going to Miami. About 12, 25, he looked at me again and said, Daddy, I want to go. And, you know, by that point, 12.30, and he looking at me like, I want to go. And I'm saying, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to take you. And he looked at me, and I could see them crocodiles swelling up in his eyes. So, you know, Daddy's on the phone half the night trying to get airplane arrangements and stuff done, packing up clothes and everything just so he can bring his namesake along with him. Um, I'm so very grateful that I have my son with me, Marvin L. Sapp II. Stand up, wave at the people, brother. Yeah. Amen. He came to hang out with his daddy. You know. Yeah. So many times when you have children and when you are full time in ministry, I don't want my son to ever grow up hating God because his daddy was never home. Yeah, that's right. So what it cost me a little bit of money to bring him. I don't know if y'all ever bought a ticket the day of. <laughs> Lord Jesus. <laughs> Boy, I love you. I just want you to know that. And then 
got to the point when when I finally took care of everything, then the wife started talking. I, you should take us all. Just, <laughs> I told her something about the mortgage, the house, if I put all y'all on the plane. Yeah, but it's good. I'm glad he's here. And, uh, was up half the night, tried to sleep on the plane. He let me sleep the first flight. The second flight, I couldn't sleep much. Got in the room, I looked at him and said, Marvin, Daddy, Daddy's really tired. I got a bad headache. Let me just take a nap. And he said, okay. And he cut on the TV in the, in the, in the, uh, in the room. And then he cut on the television in the bathroom. Then he cut on the radio. And then he went on the patio. <laughs> and every 30 minutes, he said, you got enough sleep yet? You got enough sleep yet? <laughs> so I just gave up. I said, forget it. Got here said, could somebody give me some Tylenol, please? But I'm so glad to be here. I, I'm always glad to be here. And we thank God for Bishop just showing up. We thank God for him. Amen. Amen. There are so many wonderful things that have transpired since we were last here. And time won't allow me to share them with you all but when we were last here we were just you know marvin sap youth pastor but since then we we've stepped into the office of senior pastor of the lighthouse for life center church started in october with 24 people now we have over 600 members in in an eight month period one month after the church started a pastor called my wife and I and took us out to lunch and just told us that God had released them from the city and wanted us to take over their facility and they gave us a 30,000 square foot building and since that time we have remodeled the sanctuary 600 seat sanctuary we have remodeled it and just it's just mind blowing what God is doing in the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I live. I'm going to ask that you all would keep us definitely in your prayers because, you know, when, when growth happens fast, um, where most folk would be excited, you know, I'm excited, but it's difficult to manage because it's hard to find who you can trust and who you can't. You know? So even though I'm here today and tomorrow, tomorrow's my Bible class, and this is, I think, Marvin, ain't this the first Bible class I've missed? Is this the first one? First Bible class I've missed ever in over a year. And uh, I missed one before. Okay, fine, fine. <laughs> They're going to keep you honest, ain't they, you know? Uh, well, this is the second Bible class I've missed. But thank God I have a woman of God that can handle it. My wife's at home. She holds it down for a brother. Well, let's go into the word of God tonight because I don't want to hold you all long. Um, if y'all can tell, my voice kind of whack. If y'all just give me one night of sleep. I promise y'all I'm going to sing a whole lot tomorrow before I preach. But, you know, I don't want to embarrass myself right now. The word of the Lord today is found in the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 4. Mm. First Peter, chapter number 4. You all have a wonderfully gifted, talented individual that's going to be here on Wednesday night. It's none other than Pastor John P. Key. And he's going to wreck the house and... I got cassettes of all of the preachers that have been here for the last 30 days. And I thought Bishop Curry was my friend. <laughs> I really thought we was cool. I saw all the cats that you had here. Pastor McKissick and... Oh my God. My goodness, let's see. My boy from Eden. Uh, up in Atlanta and Greg Pollard, Jasper Williams, just ain't fair. 
then I got to come here. And I'm the last one to say something. <laughs> they put all that pressure on a young preacher, boy. All that seasoned meat. So I can just give y'all some dessert anyway tonight. John ain't had enough word all week, all month. This is wonderful. The writer declares in the book of First Peter, chapter number four. Start reading at the twelfth verse. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not there, say wait a minute. I got a couple wait a minutes. The writer declares thusly, he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Beloved, think not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. Tap somebody say rejoice. rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed touch somebody else and tell them it's going to be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy i just want to talk to you all tonight if i could i want to take one word out of that 13th verse of scripture and i want to talk to you all about it for a little while and i wonder if you would just help me by looking somebody in the face and smiling at them smile some of y'all ain't smiled the whole month of consecration. And I want you to tell the person next to yourself, say, neighbor, this is your season to rejoice. Tell them one more time. Look them in the face and tell them one more time. Tell them, say, neighbor, I thought you heard me. But this is your season to rejoice. Mm. I wish you would just help the preacher one more time. Tell him, say, neighbor, I don't know what you're going through. But the preacher told me to tell you that this is your season to rejoice. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this day and this time. Now, God, I pray that you would just breathe on me. Give me insight and clarity into your word. A word that is not a sounding brass nor tingling cymbal, but a word that will encourage, motivate, and uplift these, your people. A word that will push them to new dimensions and plateaus in you. Now, God, my prayer is that you would walk up and down each and every aisle, that you would hit each and every pew. Sit on each and every person. Do not allow them to leave here the same way they came into these doors. But allow there to be a change that take place in their lives. Lord God, right now, as we stand before you, it is our prayer that you would prepare the ground of their hearts today. So that when the seed of the word is sown, that it doesn't fall upon the stony nor the thorny ground of their hearts. But indeed, allow it to fall upon fresh ground where it may be cultivated and grow. I thank you even now, Lord God, for the word that's about to proceed from my mouth. A word that's going to bring about life, encouragement. Lord God, and set them on a new path, a new road of destiny. I thank you, Lord God, and I give you glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> this is your season to rejoice. Understand you here, my dear brothers and my dear sisters. It is imperative that we understand, recognize, and realize that as individuals, as believers, that we're going to be faced with many traumatic occurrences in our lives. It is important for us to note 
that as believers that we're going to go through things. We're going to deal with issues and we're going to have to face isms and schisms as we exist as human beings. You, you must recognize that, that, that God never promised you that as you live this life that you were not going to go through anything. I'll talk to y'all over here. They don't want to hear that. God, God, God never promised you that as a believer that you weren't going to go through anything. He, he never promised you as a believer that your life was going to be just happy-go-lucky. And all you were going to do was just come into the house of God and just dance, dance, dance all night. Many of us believe that once we got saved, that at that particular point in time, that there were going to be no more trouble. We thought that once we gave our lives to the Lord, that we weren't going to have to face any more trial. We thought that once we gave our lives to the Lord, that all of the stuff that we had to deal with in the world, all of the trickery and all of the scheming and gaming, we thought that at that particular point and at that time of our conversion, that that stuff we weren't going to have to deal with anymore. But then after we were in here about five or six, seven, ten months, a year, we come to the realization that even though we're not in of the world, we're still in the world. And that everybody that professes salvation ain't really saved. <laughs> and we skipped over the part in the word of God where it tells us that if we live godly in Christ Jesus, we're going to suffer some persecution. We're going to have to go through some stuff. We're going to have to deal with some things in life. And I, I just want to encourage you all for a little while that even though you're going through it, one thing I'm glad that I've come to the realization and learned is that even though I go through things as a believer, I don't go through for the same reasons that unbelievers go through. I guess I'm talking to myself tonight. Even though I go through things as a believer, I don't go through for the same reasons that unbelievers go through. I found out Bishop Curry, and this is why I personally believe, I believe that the unbeliever goes through because God is trying to get their attention. He's trying to get them to see that they cannot live without him, but they can only exist. Because life isn't living until you have Christ in your life. That went past two or three y'all so let me stop right there again life isn't living until you have christ in your life i know you thought that when you were going to the club you were living i know you thought that when you were drinking your hennessy your cognac you were living i know you thought when you were smoking the blunts you were living but you were just existing because life did not happen until you accepted christ in your life So the reason why the unbeliever goes through is because God is trying to get their attention. He's trying to get them to see that they cannot live without him, but they can only exist. I grew up in a traditional Baptist church, not like this one, traditional, not like this one. Didn't have no organs, didn't have no drums, wasn't nobody clapping, wasn't nobody rocking. I grew up in a traditional Baptist church, and my Baptist pastor used to tell us on a Sunday to Sunday basis that we are in the land of the living on the way to the land of the dying. And after a while, when I began to grow in grace and began to understand a little bit more about God, I began to find out that he was wrong. Even though I loved him, he was wrong because I'm not in the land of the living on the way to the land of the dying, but I'm in the land of the dying on my way to the land of the living. But the reason why I'm on my way to the land of the living is not because my flesh has access to God, but it's because now I'm born again. So God is trying to get the unbeliever's attention. But then Bishop Curry, what blew my mind is God said, but the believer goes through for a whole nother reason. And that's what messed me up. Because when he said the believer goes through for a whole nother reason, I began to have a conversation with God. And I said, God, he said, yes, Marvin. I said, well, why does the believer go through? He says, Marvin, watch this. He says, the believer goes through as a catalyst to spiritual growth or change. Yeah. Say that one more time. That was good to me. He said the believer goes through as a catalyst to spiritual growth or change. In other words, God takes us through stuff when he wants us to grow. Or when he wants something inside of us to change. I'm going to say that again. That's good to me. Uh, he, he said, he said uh, the believer goes through as a catalyst to spiritual growth or change. In other words, I take them through things or I allow them to go through things when he wants us to grow or something inside of us to change. Y'all miss, let me say one more time. Uh, the believer goes through as a catalyst of spiritual growth or change. In other words, God allows us to go through stuff when he wants for us to grow or something inside of us to change. 
I gotta say it one more time because I want you to you get it. We go through as a catalyst to spiritual growth or change. In other words, God allows us to go through stuff when He wants for us to grow or something inside of us to change. Y'all missed it. Let me drop this on you real quick. Can I drop the bomb in here? Watch this. Boom. Watch this. The reason why God allows you to go through stuff as a believer simply is because He's positioning you and setting you up for promotion. Y'all want to help me tonight because I'm telling you, I'm a little tired. I'm going to teach this thing. For a little. He's positioning you and setting you up for a promotion. That's why you need to understand that the things you're going through are not by happenstance. It's not by mistake that God is allowing you to deal with some of the things that you're dealing with. It's not by mistake that you've been put in this position that you're in right now and you don't understand why you got here or how you got here. It's not by mistake that you're going through what you're going through. God is saying, I'm trying to set you up for a blessing. He said, I'm positioning you for promotion. So in order for me to position you, I have to create a paradox. God help me I have to create a paradox in other words I got to hide your breakthrough behind something because if I was to ever allow the enemy to see what I was doing in your life the devil would probably come in and steal it from you before you can get it so what I got to do is I got to hide your breakthrough behind your trouble so that when you come out of it you won't look at nobody and tell them you got it because of your family name or because of scholastic achievement or because of who you slept with but you say if it had not been for the Lord I feel this thing creeping up on me already. So give me a few minutes. And, and, uh, so God, God wants you to understand something, beloved. He wants you to understand that it's not by happenstance that you're dealing with the issues of life. The Bible says something in the book of Psalms. It says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That word ordered in the Hebrew aspect of the text is kun. Kun means to be custom designed. It means to be erected. It means to be tailored to fit. Y'all ain't catching this. I, I, I don't know if you've ever had anything custom designed before, but I've had a suit or two that's been tailored. And, and, and usually when the tailor deals with your clothing, what they do is they come in, they measure all of your bodily dimensions. And the purpose of measuring your bodily dimensions is to make sure that when the suit is cut, that it fits you a certain kind of way. I'm, I'm about to paint this picture clear and, and I'm the type of person that after I've worn the suit a while I might sew it into the life of somebody that I know and uh, I remember sewing the suit in the life of a friend of mine and when when I came to church they had the suit on one Sunday and when they walked in I looked at him and said bro you sure look good in that suit and he looked at me and said yes I understand because it's custom designed he walked away from me and I looked at him and I thought to myself yeah you look good in that suit but you don't look as good in that suit as I did and the reason why you don't look as good as I did because the suit wasn't made for you. The suit was made for me. And God sent me all the way from Grand Rapids, Michigan to tell you that that's why you can handle whatever the devil brings your way. Because before it came to your house, it went by the custom design room of God. And God tailored that thing so that it would fit your personality and your demeanor. That's why you don't need to sweat it when the enemy acts a fool. Because God ain't going to put more on you than you can handle. If it's at your house, you need to wear it until you wear it out. Tap somebody and tell them it ain't going to kill you. Oh, I know you thought it was going to take you out, but it ain't going to kill you. Oh, you just better put it on. Mm. Because if you got it in your life, it's because God realizes that it's not there to destroy you. But it's in your life to make you better. I know you feel like giving up under the pressure. But if it's there, God said, I'm going to use it to make you better. Just touch your name and tell them when I get through going through this, I'm going to be better. Y'all better say it like you mean it. Tell them when I get through going through this, I'm going to be better. Oh yeah, I'm crying now, but it's going to get better. Oh yeah, I done fell in the floor a few times, but it's going to get better. Oh yeah, I feel like cussing a few folk out, but when I come out of this, it's going to be better. Can I talk to y'all a little while in here? So God wants us to understand that even though we're going to go through things in our lives, that it's not by happenstance that we're in this, but it's been a setup from the beginning. And when we recognize that it's a setup then, two things need to change in our lives. The first thing that needs to change is our mentality. 
<laughs> Y'all ain't going to talk to me today. Now when I'm going through situations in life, I don't trip when the stuff happens. But I step back and look at the purpose of my trouble. Because behind every trouble, there is a purpose. Y'all don't want to hear me now. I said behind every trouble, there is a purpose. So when the stuff hits me, now I step back and look at it and say, wait one minute. I don't know why this is in my life. I didn't do nothing to reap this. I didn't sow this kind of stuff to reap it. So now I'm stepping back and I'm looking at it. I'm checking it out. And if it's in my life, it must be a reasoning for it being here. And the only reason why I can think about it being in my life is somehow, some way, the devil done peeked into my future. He sees what God's about to bring me into. Trying to get me to quit before I get what God said. But now that I know what he's trying to do, when he comes at me, I'm not going to fold under the pressure. But I'm going to say, ah, you tried to sneak up on me. Yeah. You tried to get me to quit, didn't you? You thought I was going to throw in the towel. But I recognize that greater is he that's within me. Tap somebody and tell them I'm too close to quit now. See, see, he should have got me before I got the revelation. He, he should have got me before God showed me some stuff. See, when I was walking around here having a pity party, trying to find people to validate me in my trouble, that's when he should have got me. He should have got me when I was walking around here looking for everybody to hold my hand. But now that I can stand up on my own two feet, ah! God help me, I feel this. So, so the first thing that has to happen, I wish y'all just let me talk to y'all a little bit. The first thing that has to happen is you have to change your mentality. You got to think differently about where you are. You, you have to think differently about where you are. You have to change the way that you think. The way that you look at your situations. You don't look at them now from the standpoint of being roadblocks, but you look at them now from the standpoint of being stepping stones. You, you have to change the way that you think. But not only do you have to change the way you think, but the next thing you got to do is you got to change your vocabulary. Oh God, help me up in here. Tell somebody I'm telling you how to change your vocabulary. Some of you all in here need to understand that when you get in the midst of trouble, that the Bible is right in Proverbs 18, uh, 21, where it says that life and death is in the power of your tongue. And see, the reason why some of us are still going through, because every time we open up our mouths as Holy Ghost filled believers, we're spitting venom on our own situation. And when we speak those things out of our mouth, that revelation begins to manifest itself in the natural and it begins to show us what we said but I stop by here to tell you that if you make up in your mind that no matter what you see in your natural you're not going to speak it out your mouth because of the fact that you understand that what you speak can happen because destiny is released in the words that you speak as a Holy Ghost filled believer you need to make up in your mind I'm changing my vocabulary I don't care how bad it looks I will never say it looks bad I don't care how it looks difficult it looks. I will never say it looks difficult. I don't care if my child is acting a fool. I'm just going to tell my child, you're not bad. You're just mischievous right now. Even if you are broke, you need to stop saying you broke. And you need to say, I'm in between blessings. Waiting on the blesser to bless me one more time. Change your vocabulary. I don't care how bad it gets. You need to make up in your mind that I ain't got time to complain. I ain't got time to murmur. I ain't got time to look for nobody else to help me get through this stuff. So what? It looks bad. So what? I can't depend on nobody. I'm not going to speak it, but I'm going to change it and I'm going to rejoice. Can I exegete the text for a minute? The Bible says... The Bible says, the Bible says, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. In other words, he's saying, don't think it's strange if you should be confronted with a situation as if situation should be something strange to you. Don't, don't think it's strange if you should be hit with a dilemma as if being hit with a dilemma should be something strange to you. Don't think it's strange if, if, if you're stabbed in the back 
as if being stabbed in the back should be something strange to you. Don't think it's strange if somebody talks about you like a low-down, dirty dog, as if being talked about like a low-down, dirty dog should be something strange to you. Don't think it's strange if somebody did you wrong, as if being done wrong should be something strange to you. Because God never promised you that you were going to live a life that is always going to be great and supreme. But he did promise you that if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer some persecution. So don't think it's strange if you should be hit with a situation as if it should be something strange don't act like you all surprised he says think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you but, but, but let me get back because he says think it not strange concerning the fiery trial the word fiery trial in the Greek, Bishop Curry, is porosis. Porosis means a burning or a refining. Now, now, I went to God because me and God, we tight like that. And I began to have a conversation with my God. I said, God, he said, yes, Marvin. I said, God, I cannot go down to new birth and tell the people at new birth that you're trying to kill them for their belief in you. He said, see, he said, no, no, that's not what I'm trying to do. I said, well, God, I, I need to understand what I'm trying to do. He said, well, Marvin, in order for you to understand it, you've got to look at the text a little deeper. Because when you begin to look at the text a little deeper, you understand that Simon Peter was writing to elect scattered throughout Asia Minor, both Jews and Gentiles of that region to encourage them upon the plight that they were facing. These people were literally being burned at the stake for their belief in Jesus Christ. So when he says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, he's saying, don't think it's strange if you should be snatched up and burned at the stake, fish burn, simply because you've seen so many others burned at the stake. You've seen your mama, your daddy, your sister, your brother, them. You've seen all them burned at the stake. So don't think it's strange if you should be snatched up and burned at the stake for your belief in Jesus Christ. I said, well, God, I can't tell them that you're trying to kill them. He said, that's not what I'm trying to do. I said, well, explain to me what you're trying to do he said before I can put them in a position of prominence I have to take them through a process I said explain the process he said the first phase of the process is porosis I said porosis he said yes porosis means a burning or a refining he said when I take them through their fiery trials I'm not trying to kill them but I'm trying to burn off everything that's not like me <laughs> oh, y'all, y'all. God is saying, I can, I, I'm not going to move you to a new dimension in me until I get some of that stuff in you, out of you. Because fire not only kills, but it purifies. And he said, first thing I got to do is I got to kill some stuff that's on the inside of you. I got to kill your stanky attitudes. I got to kill your mean and cantankerous ways. I got to kill your ideologies. I got to kill your traditions. There are certain things in you I got to kill. But when I get through killing I'm gonna burn some other stuff off of you so that I can refine you so that when you get to the place of prominence you won't look and say I did it I did it I did it but you'll tell everybody and their mama the only reason why I'm here is because of the grace and the mercy of God because I shouldn't be here but God who was rich in mercy decided to love me He says, he says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. I'm going to preach tomorrow, I promise y'all. Concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But then he shifts and says, but rejoice. I'm messed up now because he informs me that I'm going to go through something. He gives me the information that it's going to happen so that when it happens, I won't be surprised. But then he tells me, even though you know it's coming and even though you know it's going to hurt, when it gets there, I want you to rejoice. No, wait a minute. 
that, 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 that's what messed me up, Bishop, because you informed me that something that's going to come into my life is going to hurt me. And then once it gets there, you still tell me that I'm supposed to rejoice. Y'all ain't missing. Uh, the, 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 the word rejoice, the word rejoice, the word rejoice in the Greek is a Greek word, kario. Ka kario means to be joyful, to cry out or to shout. It means to show forth exuberant praise and or adoration to that which you deify and or glorify. In other words, when he tells us to rejoice here in this text, he's literally telling us, watch this, that we're supposed to praise God, not based upon what he's done, hmm. but we're supposed to take our eyes off of our own personal circumstances and bless God even in spite of what's happening. Y'all don't want to talk to me today. I, let me let me explain to you like this it, it's easy for me to praise god when i don't know i'm about to go through <laughs> but it's difficult for me to praise god when you didn't gave me the revelational understanding that i'm about to go in the trouble y'all ain't gonna walk y'all looking at me strange let me say it to you like this I, I can remember when i was a little boy i can remember when i was a little boy and my mama my mama told me she said marvin i don't want you touching nothing in this store don't touch it now if you touch it i'm gonna beat you i'm gonna beat you that's what she told me now that was before y'all start calling the police on your mamas and daddies y'all ain't gonna say that uh, yes uh, but back then she told me she was gonna whoop me if i touched anything and I went in the store and I began to touch everything in the store. And she went for me, Lord help me. And I got scared. But then she said something that messed me up. She said, as soon as I get you home, I'm going to whoop your butt. Now, now, I looked up at my mama and I began to cry. And I, I began to beg her, mama, please don't beat me, mama, please. Mama, I'm sorry, I ain't going to touch nothing else. I promise, mama, please, mama, please. Please, mama, if you don't whoop me, I won't touch nothing else. She said, if you touch another thing, boy, I'm going to half kill you. But if I would have looked, if my mother would have looked, at me and told me while we were at the store that she was going to whoop me and if I would have looked up at her and said oh mama I thank you yeah, I thank you for the whooping mama mm -hmm. oh I give you glory for the whooping mama oh yeah beat me beat me beat me take that rod of correction and drive away all that foolishness that's within me mama oh beat me like crazy I'll be a better child if you whoop me mama if you whoop me she would have looked at me like I was nuts if I would have begun to bless her for informing me before for the whooping yes that she was going to beat me but that's what god is telling some of y'all he's saying the whooping is on his way to your house oh he about to get you real good but don't complain about what you're going through but lift up your hands in the midst of it and tell god thank you uh, he says he says he says rejoice he informs us that we're going to go through something and then he tells us what he wants us to do is he wants us to bless him even when we go through it. He tells us that he wants for us to give him glory. And that's the second phase of the process, beloved, because what God wants you to understand is that after he puts you in the position of porosis by burning stuff off of you, he wants you to bless him even while you're under the heat. He wants you to bless him even while the pressure is stripping stuff off of you. Why? Because the fact of the matter is, is that if it's hot, it's because he's controlling. Y'all ain't catching that here. If it's difficult, it's because he's controlling the situation. But he says, while you're going through it, I want you to rejoice. Rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. I got to stop. I got to stop. Because when he says we are partakers of Christ's suffering, what he's saying here is that he and I are connected. He's saying that Christ and I are connected. And I'm supposed to mark the perfect man. Yes. And not only mark the perfect man, but I'm supposed to use him as an example of how I'm supposed to deal with my trouble. In other words, when I'm going through situations, I'm not supposed to look at individuals and how they dealt with their situations but I'm supposed to look to the author and the finisher of my faith and check out how he dealt with his mess and if he dealt with his mess in the right way I should deal with my mess in the right way I can see Jesus even now being nailed to the cross and going through difficult pains and trouble and even while he's in the midst of a bad situation the Bible speaks and says he doesn't say a word but when he does open up his mouth notice what he says he says father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing you need to understand that the first phase of the process is you have to learn how to praise him out of relationship because when you're in relationship with God you're not praising him for what he's doing
doing but you're praising him in spite of what you're going through see it's easy to bless God when you got a car a house a chicken in the pot rice on the stove but when all hell is breaking loose then you ain't got nothing to reach to but the fact that you're in relationship with him and you're gonna bless him anyhow But after you begin to praise him out of relationship, look at what happens here. He says, rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. When Jesus says here in the word, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. What he does here is the first thing he does is he speaks life into their situation. He doesn't divulge or look at the circumstances and begin to complain about where he is. But he looks at them, not his own circumstances, and he begins to speak life into his situation and God told me to tell somebody that that's what you got to do you got to stop looking at what's going on around you and even in the midst of what you're going through you need to just speak a life in your missile situation oh yeah 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 I could complain about where I am but there is somebody else that's going through a worse situation than what I'm going through I could complain about how troublesome my life is but sister so and so is dealing with something a little bit rougher than what I'm dealing with you got to learn how to speak life in your trouble stop complaining stop murmuring stop walking around here looking for people to hold your hand through your trouble and go to your house look yourself in the mirror have a conversation with yourself stop all that doggone crying pull yourself together you're not no sucker you're not no punk you're a mighty man a woman of God do your shoulders back and stand up in here Uh, I got to get through this thing real quick. Uh, so you need to understand my beloved brothers and my beloved sisters. It is imperative that firstly you learn how to speak life into the midst of your trouble. But notice also what Jesus says. Because the Bible says that Jesus says forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. I got to stop right there for a minute. He says, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So, so not only do you got to learn how to praise God out of relationship, not only do you got to learn how to speak life in your trouble, but before God can move you to the place that he's trying to move you to, you also got to learn how to forgive folk. Y'all don't want to hear me now. See, some of us don't even realize that the reason why God can't put us in the position of prominence and prestige is because we're so busy holding stuff against individuals that we should have let go of a long time ago. Uh, I made up in my mind I don't have time to be holding grudges and being bitter and angry with folk about something that they did 5, 10, 15 years ago. I have a destiny. I have a purpose that God wants me to fulfill. And I made up in my mind that I'm going to lay aside every weight and sin. Y'all ain't here. That so easily beset me. Some of y'all just got some weights in your way. And that's why you can't get what God said you could have. But when you make up in your mind, I'm loosing myself. And I'm releasing you from any obligation that I feel that you owe me I ain't got time to be mad at you because you borrowed ten dollars from me and never paid me back I ain't got time to be mad at you because you knew I like brother man and now y'all been married for ten years I ain't got time oh I'm uh, uh, oh, y'all ain't saying nothing it's quiet now yeah tap somebody and tell you better let it go you better let it go Anything that's going to keep me from getting what God said I'm supposed to walk into, I'm letting it go. Anything that's keeping me from being everything that God has called me to be, I'm going to let it go. I ain't got time to be tripping. I ain't got time to be fussing. I ain't got time to be arguing with you. If that's your opinion, so be it. Because it's a God that I serve. It's the God that I serve. And a charge to keep I have. And a God to glorify. I got to get through this thing, Doc. So the Bible tells him, I tell him, let it go. That's all I'm saying. T tell, tell him, let it go, let it go. You've been holding on to it long, let it go. You've been walking around here angry too long, let it go. That's why you got ulcers, you better let it go. That's why your blood pressure shooting through the roof, you better let it go. That's why you're walking around here losing your hair, I got to put weave in, let it go. That's why, that's why, that's why, let it go. Let it go, let it go, let it go. 
So then we need to understand that the Bible, the Bible, the Bible says. Bible says rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed. Ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. When you begin to look at the last words in that text which says exceeding joy. The words exceeding joy in the Greek is agileo. Agileo means to jump for joy. Now I'm a little confused now because when I begin to read the text, I don't see nowhere in the word of God where I'm going to be so excited where I'm going to jump for joy. Matter of fact, when I begin to look at the process that I'm going to have to go through, it embitters me and it makes me extremely angry. Because when I begin to read and examine the text, understand, if you will, that it begins to mess me up because he tells me firstly that I'm going to go through a fiery trial. Tells me firstly that I'm going to go through something that is uncomfortable and that is difficult. But even though I'm going to go through something that's uncomfortable and difficult, he tells me to praise him out of a relationship. But then not only does he tell me to praise him out of a relationship, but he also tells me to speak a life in my trouble. And then he also tells me to forgive others. And I don't know about y'all, but I don't see nowhere after doing all of that. Well, I'm going to be so excited where well, I'm going to jump for joy. Oh, let me break it down even that much the clearer. He, he tells me that I'm going to go through something that's going to hurt. Tells me that I'm going to go through something that's going to make me feel bad. Tells me that I'm going to go through something that is going to make me feel like fighting. Thank you. Tells me I'm going to go through something that's going to make me feel like throwing in the towel. Mm, yes. But after I go through this, then he tells me to rejoice or to praise him even though I don't feel like it. And then he tells me to speak life into something that I don't even see. And then he tells me to forgive folk that I don't even like. And then after I do all that, I'm going to be so excited where I'm going to jump for joy. I don't see nowhere in, thank you, nowhere in the text where I'm going to be so excited where I'm going to jump for joy. Matter of fact, when I begin to look at it, I begin to get a little bit angry. But if you notice, if you will, in the word of God, I begin to skip a place because the writer says rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering that that when his glory shall be revealed that's why I gotta stop right there mm, yeah because you need to understand that God is taking you through this process because he wants you to understand that when you praise him out of relationship and when you speak a life in the midst of your trouble mm, and when you decide to forgive others that is literally the access code that you need to get into the glory of God. Can I talk to y'all a few minutes up in here? Tell your neighbors, say neighbor, that's where you want to be. You want to be in the glory of God. Why do I want to be in the glory of God? Can I tell you why I want to be in the glory of God? Because when you get caught up in the glory of God, there is something that God wants to do in your life. When you get caught up in the glory of God, why do I want to be in the glory of God? Because in the glory of God, there are windows. Tap somebody and tell them there's windows in his glory. I wish I can preach here a few minutes here now. I, if you read the word of God in the book of Malachi, yes, the Bible says, "For out of the windows of heaven, he said he's going to pour you out blessings that you don't have room enough to receive. And you need to understand that in the glory of God, that windows are not just to pour out of, yes, but they're also to look into. Yeah, Y'all ain't catching this in here. God said that when you access the glory, he says there's something that he wants to show you and the only way you can see it is you have to get caught up in his glory in other words you got to be spiritually minded and the only way that you're going to be spiritually minded is you got to make sure that you alleviate yourself from all of that excess stress and pressure that is within your life I said can I preach you a few minutes here now what is it that he wants to show me when I get caught up in the glory of God can I tell 
tell you what he wants to show you the first thing he wants to show you he wants to show you where you are right now yeah yes but not only does he want to show you where you are right now but he also wants to show you what you're going through yes but not only does he want to show you what you're going through but he also wants to show you what you're going to look like when he brings you out and once you see what you're going to look like when he brings you out something on the inside of you is going to make you jump I wish I had a witness up in here. Yeah. Is there anybody in here yeah, that wants to get access into his glory? Yeah. If you want to get access into his glory, yeah, you got to make up in your mind. Yeah. I'm ready to go here now. Yeah. You got to make up in your mind yeah, that no matter how bad it is, yeah, I'm going to bless God anyhow. Yeah. Because the only reason why the devil is tripping yeah, is because he's trying to get me to believe yeah, that God has forsaken me. Yeah. It's trying to get me to believe that God has dissed me. It's trying to get me to believe that God has just dropped me off. But the reason why he wants me to praise him because the only way he's going to show me what he's about to do in my life is he has to get me in a place where I can't go to the right. He has to get me in a place where I can't go to the left. He has to get me in a place where I can't go back with a forward but the only thing I can do is drop down on my knees and say father I stretch good God almighty my hand to thee no other help I know can I preach it for a little while understand beloved that God wants to show you some stuff tap somebody tell them that's why you gotta praise him because he's trying to show you some things you're wondering why you go through lift your hands and give him glory if you're wondering how you're going to get out, lift your hands and give him glory. If it looks like he's not with you in the midst of your troubles, you got the access code. Use what you got to get out of what you're in. I wish I had somebody in here that would just make up in your mind by any means necessary. I'm going to get what God said I can have. I'm going to praise him until he shows me what the outcome of my situation is I wish I had somebody in here is there anybody in this house made up in your mind come hell or high water I'm gonna bless him anyhow I've been going through too long I tried everything that I could do to get out of my own trouble I tried everything that I to do uh, to make it on my own I'm desperate now tell somebody I'm desperate now I done tried everything I might as well try praising him Is there anybody in here that's ready to send the SOS? Because that's all your praise is. It's an SOS sign. God said, if you praise me, I'll move on your behalf. He said, if you praise me, I'll do some great things for you. Is there anybody in here tired of going through? God said, I want to show you something. But you got to come up here. You can't stay down there. You got to come up here. And your praise will take you higher. Is there anybody in here ready to go higher? Going through too long. Dealing with trouble too long. Going through hell too long. But my praise is going to make the difference. I wish I had somebody that would just help me praise him. I don't know what you're going through. But I found out that praise is a stress reliever. I wish I had somebody in here. Praise is a stress reliever. I wish I had some help. Praise. 